All right. So I'm, I'm Amos King. Um, I get to talk to people a lot who do really cool things um, and, and not do as many cool things as the people that I talk to. And today I get to be joined with Justin Schneck and Frank Hunleth, who have done some really cool things in the nerves environment. And uh, how about you guys introduce yourselves a little bit? Nerves you start, Frank? <laughs> All right. Uh, Frank Hunleth, uh, um, I work on the nurse project with uh, Justin. I've been doing this for a while, so I, I think we'll probably talk a little bit more about how I got started, but uh, basically started, I forget, like six or seven or eight years ago with Erlang and then switched over to, you know, using Elixir mostly and been working on it ever since and more recently um, for work as well. So, Justin? Uh, yeah, Justin Schneck, I've been... Um, it's been a while since I was doing something else, but several lifetimes ago, I spent time doing uh, recording engineering work, playing music, um, which naturally transmission uh, 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 transfers over into knowledge of starting your programming, doing like C++ and uh, worked with Objective-C and Swift and mobile design for a long period of time and uh, then uh, sort of utterly became obsessed with embedded electronics, tiny computers and uh, systems engineering. And uh, ever since then, been working together with Frank and, and others on uh, open source and all kinds of varieties and nerves and nerve sub and, and more. So, that's, uh, well, thank, thanks for coming today and, and, and talking with, with all of us. And, and I kind of want to go back to that that history. So Frank, you said you started with Erlang and Nerves is known for being on the Elixir platform. Um, so we're all running on the beam, but what what caused that switch from Erlang into Elixir? So um, just let me rewind to when I was, so Nerves um, started out, it was Erlang. I didn't know that Elixir existed. And uh, um, I was mostly, uh, very intrigued by the beam. Um, so I, be, prior to uh, working or looking into Erlang, I was working at a telecom um, equipment manufacturer, which we programmed similar things to uh, many of the uh, um, things that Ericsson had done. So reading the, uh, the Erlang articles really resonated with me. And of course I was doing everything in C++, um, um, just, you know, obviously not as, um, not as elegantly. Uh, so, I've been wanting to do to pull in the beam and then got into Erlang and then finally, um, I think a few people on this list may have seen me at the, the uh, um, beam uh, the uh, Erlang factories a long time ago. But um, while I was there, I ended up meeting um, Garth Hitchens, who was an early adopter of Nerves, but his interests were in Elixir. He got me excited about that. And then later on, Justin um, popped in and he uh, really. Pulled, um, worked um, through a lot of the tooling on making nerves actually easy to use. So I think for, you know, it's, it's kind of rewinding back to the early times. I mostly just wanted to get um, um, Erlang compiling nicely on the types of embedded systems that, that I used. So I was quite happy with shell scripts, uh, but, uh, and just pure Linux development. Um, Justin kind of opened up the way to um, getting this more cross-platform in terms of the development systems. And then kind of the fun part for me was, you know, Justin's helping, um, Garth Hitchens actually building a production product um, with Nurse. And uh, there's a lot of excitement. I think, uh, Justin, you presented at some of the early Elixir conferences. Um, and not only did it get a good reception, but people are actually using it and trying it out and putting it in, um, you know, more like prototypes, at the, I think, at the time at their jobs. Um, but that was that was pretty cool. So. You know, I kind of went where the energy was. It's a lot of fun to see your stuff used. So that's, uh, I think that's why I started switching over. But just so the Erlangers in the audience, the roots are still there. <laughs> there's um, uh, there's uh, lots of stuff that can be run in Erlang. Um, I haven't forgotten that for sure. Not, not to digress too much there, but there are also uh, uh, Erlang flavored Lisp uh, uh versions that work as far as samples are concerned there's one oh, that yeah. compiles right yeah so it's not yep. it's 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 open to to others yeah 
yeah, anything that runs on the beam mostly runs. I think for our examples, LFE has a little place. Of course, LFE is fun for, for I don't know, it's fun for me. Kind of wish I could use it more, but it's, it's kind of a fun digression. It makes me happy. Um, then the other language that just recently got added to our examples is uh, one called Zig. So those of you wanting to, to do something more, you know, on the NIST side, a little bit faster. Zig is kind of a language that makes C a little bit nicer. It turned out to integrate really nicely with NERF. So I got all excited about it. And uh, um, Isaac, uh, the, the author of the um, Ziggler package was really helpful in getting to work with NERFs. So that's not an option for, I, I think a certain kind of NIST that uh, you might want to write for that language. I thought you didn't like NIFs, Frank. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> but, but Zig is cool. I'm still going for that. <laughs> are, we, are we going through that? I don't know. What, what's, uh, what, why, why NIFs versus ports? Or how do you, how do you feel about that in the nerves world? And, yeah, so this is kind of... Um, wasn't expecting to go down this, but I think <laughs> a lot of us uh, who got um, hooked into the beam kind of got hooked in for the, uh, the robustness guarantees that it gives. And you throw a little bit of that out with NIFs um, and doing anything that pulls into the same um, process space. So I think for the first, I don't know, three years, maybe longer, I was completely anti any, you know, any NIF, anything that pulled itself in because I did not want to pollute this nice little sanctuary that uh, we were running our code on. Um, I think uh, it led to a couple um, interesting things. Like uh, for those of you who work a bit more with hardware, there's a, this thing called a, a GPIO, a general purpose IO. And it is a common fun thing for people to do when they come to a new platform is, how quickly can I turn this GPIO? It's, it's basically a wire. How quickly can I turn it on or off, on or off? And it's, it, I mean, overall, it's kind of a silly thing to do because like, why would you just turn it on and off, on and off? Um, especially when most of these processors have way better hardware accelerated ways of turning on and off in the ways to communicate with the things that you want to uh, use it for. But anyway, they do that. So I was, I was so stubborn. Um, I put the, uh, I had the GPIO toggling happening in a port. So you basically go from Elixir, call into a, you know, making, call into another OS process to turn on the wire, and then come back. And as you can imagine, it wasn't all that fast. I think uh, we peaked at, you know, a few hundred Hertz on a gigahertz machine. I think I, I didn't even implement it that well, but uh, um, now of course we've moved on some people. So if you do want to, if toggling a wire is your thing, um, I, um, it's in diff now. It works a little bit better. I don't think it's a great thing to do, but uh, I think we're past that that part. So, how about, how about you, Justin? How do you feel about NIFs? Ports versus Since, NIF. Well, I mean, Frank wrote C at one point in time, so I thought that he might really enjoy NIFs. So it it surprised me. So I'm like, how do you feel about about that? Like the the, uh, I mean, uh, the world, so to speak. Pr proceed with caution, right? Uh, um, the, the the as Frank was mentioning, one of the great guarantees, or, or one of the great the great uh, uh, things that we get with Erlang is the process model and allowing us to be able to to, to set up supervision trees and understand how to be able to like handle uh, failure semantics is like a, a first class part of the uh, the, the system, right? And, and uh, you kind of lose that when you write in dangerous spaces that that can you know blow up your uh, blow up prevention system you know like uh, and and in those cases like you still can recover but uh, it's going to be a much more difficult problem to to debug or trace through if if the system just kind of reboots out of out of uh, you know for reasons um, or if if it explodes in a way that's that that you can't really observe too well um, in the case of ports you can kind of isolate that. Uh, explosion and um, um, you know there there is the the trade off of uh, performance, but um, if if you can kind of structure things in a way uh, that maybe a lot of your heavy lifting is done in in its own run loop uh, outside of the beam, and that you just have to check in periodically, you know, to be able to capture feedback or integrate that portion of your code with the the wider system, 
uh, then you can still achieve that kind of with ports. Yeah, it, it's all about granularity. Yeah, it's, it's just ports you have to give them a little bit more work yeah. to, to make it. it yeah, and you see that the speed in, the speed performance is the thing that that's usually going to sell you. People look at ports and NIFs and they're like, "Well, NIFs are faster. I might as well go down that route." And um, all of this just to be able to say, uh, consider your use and uh, and the dangers that come along along with it. So when when the two of you got together and started working on this, uh, I know that Frank, you started out in Erlang, and later Justin came on board and, and helped get the tooling and everything going. Did, did either of you ha imagine how big that nerves would become in, in the community? No, but it's, but we're thrilled people use it. Like that's the best thing ever is to see. It, you know, the surprise that I had was, is um, um, I was interested in the beam for my work project. So so my trouble with, with just using Erlang off the shelf was um, it was, there's a lot of work to get to work well in a bed system. I know Ericsson had their stuff working and I met up with a few other people who had some really nice ways of, of embedding Erlang on, an, on the embed system. But it, um, it uh, the ones that I was building, it was like a pretty big upgrade. Like there's a lot to take, so I I like to compare this with uh, you know another language, um, you know like Lua, right? You know it's easy to pull Lua into a lot into a new project because it's just a little language, uh, and you can kind of link it in, maybe put it out in the corner. But Erlang for it to 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 you real is to really use it, you, it kind of has to run the system. Um, it's a big thing to take on. So I I wanted it for that case. I was I started nervous just trying to. Look, um, to figure out how to get this so there would be less of less of an effort to pull into a project, and uh, um, it's kind of fun to work on. And then I think that the 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 surprise that I had, which was once Justin joined up, he made the project a lot more accessible. And I have to say, I've gotten a ton of enjoyment seeing a lot of the random things that people posted on Twitter done with the project. Just you know. Not even people who do electronics for a living or embed it, just trying out new things, applying, um, <clears throat> um, you know, some of the skills that they have on the back end side, and uh, you know, me getting to learn a little bit about that end, except in the embedded context. Yeah, and I ended up uh, coming at it from the approach of accessibility almost completely. Like I, I had that uh, naive entry point, as you could tell from from. Uh, uh, you know, in the beginning of this, when I, when I talked about my entry being like C++ and then pivoting over to object oriented languages uh, and, you know, like functional languages were foreign to me for, for a long period of time. Uh, funny enough, I actually recall in my earlier career, uh, early in my career, like uh, having an argument over object oriented languages being something uh, more powerful even than functional. But uh, at the time I was still young as a developer, so I'm not going <laughs> to hold on to that one too much. <laughs> but uh uh, you know, I, 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 I fell in love with embedded electronics and just wanting to be able to uh, blend the approach of uh, that, that the, like uh, languages like Ruby and such has, has, has allowed to be able to, to bring uh, accessibility to, to the field, right? And, and I found myself during the time, like before I met up with Frank, uh, uh, having a lot of thought experiments and in and, and, uh, and, and, and Ruby, like, uh, effectively trying to build OTP, you know, and then and then when I realized that that was what was being constructed and Erlang was already built upon these principles, then um, it became uh, obvious to me uh, that what Frank was starting during the time what he was working on with nerves and uh, uh, was was really like a, a great place to be able to to fit it all together, and um, and it's funny because you know the, my my. Um, my introduction to this was still, in that case, very naive. Like I was still young. It was a, a while back, and I've learned so much between now and then about uh, about these, uh, uh, like my own feelings about building embedded systems. And and I've I've sort of let time, as time pass, harden my convictions towards uh, what I believe are are fundamental requirements for building embedded systems. And a lot of uh, Erlang, OTP, the process models, and uh, uh, things of that nature kind of uh, stand up a lot of those, you know, as such. And 
And so uh, that's why I love to be able to continue doing it is because not only have we worked really hard to be able to make it accessible to others so that uh, other people can kind of feel that same joy that I was feeling um, not having to be so uh, in depth with lower level languages to be able to get anywhere with any sort of project that you want to be able to push forward. Um, but uh, to do it in a way that produces a responsible output, you know, like it's not just about performance and accessibility, but uh, it's it's about, uh, you know, making um, like good uh, choices for uh, longevity of the project, for being able to make it uh, uh, sustainable, like your output, you know, not being wasteful, not th not just throwing Docker at it and like 10 gigs worth of uh, container images and, you know, some something like that. Like it's, this is a, this is an environment where we still need to be conscious of uh, power and uh, and resources. Yeah. So, Amos, I don't know if you're checking the questions, but uh, we, we have a few questions. If you, um, I um, am. You can read them. Go for it. If there's one you want to answer, well, I, you just... I, I skipped one from uh, Keithley, and he knows what he asks. Um, so, um, there's. I'm just looking down. So there's a, one on NX, and I think that uh, just now I wanted to um, comment just slightly on NX. Um, Super, um, super excited about the about NX. Um, I don't have much to add. I'm kind of in learn mode now. Um, one of the reasons why I'm kind of excited, maybe not be, be is, isn't necessarily because of the machine learning aspect, which I, you know, is certainly cool. It's more the fact that uh, um, I now have fast math on on uh, on big arrays, and now I'm kind of, you know, my mind's wandering on. What I can do with that, with sticking in, um, staying inside of Elixir versus uh, going out to sea and seeing how that works. So I think it's, I think my 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 answer is I'll have a way better answer, you know, six months from now. And then Justin, you you have a little bit more maybe just mention on NX. Uh, yeah, I mean we are um, um, we've actually been uh, working with it lately. It's it's um, a little bit of a tricky beast to be able to get to actually cross compile with CUDA support for accelerated GPU backends on nerds devices. Um, you know, like it's, it's effectively, uh, at this point, uh, doing XLA bindings and, uh, uh, that's a behemoth of a project that's difficult. Uh, it's built system is, is, is a, a little um, intense for getting going. And so, um, building it natively on the devices, we've done some throughput tests and it's, it's, uh, it appears to be really, uh, performant. Um, and so I'm excited to be able to mess with it further as well. Um, I'm interested in uh, uncovering more from the training perspective of uh, machine learning science, uh, data science uh, and uh, playing with it more uh, from the uh, implementation inference methods as well. Um, there's another question about NERVS Novice and Quemu, which is a really good question. It's because uh, um, uh, we, for, the project had, for a long time had a Quimu target. And I think a lot of people are kind of like, like, okay, I got nerves. Let me just try it on, on Quimu, see what we can do with it. The, uh, um, we ended up, um, um, closing out the project, our Quimu support. And it was, uh, um, I have, I have mixed feelings about it. So. It is still possible to run stuff on Quemu. It's not a good experience at all, in my opinion. Um, we've been pushing people more towards um, actually using a Raspberry Pi or um, um, a BeagleBone or one of the low cost boards, um, not doing emulated. And some of the reasons that came in is one, um, at the time, the Quemu support um, ran a little slow and you couldn't really do much. Like if you, you couldn't like, do GPIO, you couldn't communicate with I squared C, you couldn't um, do anything over SPI or do a little display, or you can't do much with a light up an LED. Um, it's kind of disappointing in some sense. And then there was a little networking access that, that made it not quite the best experience. And maybe that was because we didn't know how to make it a great experience through Quimu. But uh, time-wise, we, we were just looking at it and we were thinking if you can get a Raspberry Pi, um, that was that would be the easier way to go. 
Yeah, I mean, it was so, like resource limited, right? Like, like there were times where Quemu ran slower than the slowest actual hardware targets <laughs> that, are, like, that that we've messed with. It felt. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, mainly because they never, uh, it was never a multi-threaded or multi-processor support for the I'm, host. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I think that there's some history that my things are better now, but I think that the main thing was is it's just you get it going, you can print stuff out, and that was that was about it. I think that if uh, someone were really interested in getting going again, I certainly would love to have the help, but I think it's something that I need a little assistance in making a good experience. Yeah, vir virtualized targets were always um, uh, a very desirable thing. I mean, making it more accessible and easier to be able to, to, to test this stuff. From an onboarding perspective, Quemu, Quemu and virtualized targets made a lot of sense, but um, there was a period of time when we worked on Nerves Hub where uh, the original, as I say this quotes wise, the original version of Nerves Hub was like a, a, a tight uh, Phoenix loop script that would check a server and over WebSockets start streaming down connections to these uh, devices that we happened to plug in around of different various different targets. And we had we had this like test mechanism working and it kind of like is what gave us a lot of uh, uh, feedback and encouragement for that, that that portion of for Nerves Hub for the deployment and, and management section of things. And I still have this uh, I still have this desire for us to be able to to uh, circle back around to, to have an automated fashion that we can tie that back together with. Um, there's just uh, so much work to be done with uh, uh, with the with these projects always and 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 some of the new features uh, kind of kind of sit on the side while you wait on some performing some of the maintenance but uh, um, there are ways today that you could you could set up uh, canary stations and deployments and stuff, uh, such using nerve sub so that you can at least have some uh, warm fuzzy feelings with uh, um, uh, that your builds aren't going to break things in production before you deploy out. So we oh, go ahead, Amos. I, I was going to say, we, have, say we, we do have one question about, is there anything new coming up in nerves hub, like analytics, uh, edge analytics, leveraging Broadway, things like that. Um, so do you, do you have anything new come in, in way of nerve sub since you brought it up? <laughs> um, uh, we, uh, um, uh, well, uh, uh, Binary Noggin and, and Frank and others in the team have uh, put a great effort forward on uh, adding a lot of uh, backend engineering enhancements to Nerves Hub, um, keeping, uh, updating, updating it. Uh, we're, we're looking at performance upgrades as well and using different WebSocket connections, trying that kind of stuff out. Um, uh, and uh, uh, from, from uh, um, the larger perspective, there's always also been this desire to have more enhanced reporting and visibility and analytics. Uh, and um, uh, we've actually started uh, discussing this externally with other organizations to involve more consultancies, more people in the community uh, to be able to try to um, fund the development uh, of Nerves Hub moving forward to add some of these features and, and bring it to a really nice uh, 1.0 stable place. Yeah, yeah I think. Uh, oh. The other thing they had, to, so the, I guess there are a couple places where Nerves Hub is moving, and the ones that I'm more interested in have been um, have been the low bit rate usage. So a lot of the devices that I work on at my company, and this is not unusual, um, are over metered connections. Um, the uh, the challenges is if you're if you're getting charged um, um, per you know per byte or so, or even if you're pulled. You're, you don't want to send too much, but you also, as a software engineer, like sending updates out to firmware updates out to your devices, you also want to be able to send updates out, uh, you know, at a, kind of a regular pace or when needed. Like if you have a, a security vulnerability, getting something out and not having to think too hard about uh, the whether um, you're going over your um, your budget, your cellular budget, is kind of nice. So reducing that bits has been. The number of bits has been a pressure to that end. Um, so there have been recent updates. I mean, all these are kind of like little small things, but taken together, you know, it's, it helps. Um, recently, it's more flaky networks restarting updates later on. Um, little detail stuff. I think uh, the other thing to mention that uh, we've had, and I think we've we've mentioned this a little bit, but I'm not sure if it's been loudly broadcast, which is the differential updates, the, the delta updates. 
um, you can turn on a mode on there. So when you send your firmware image up, Nerfs Hub can say, okay, this device over here is running firmware at version X. You know, this is firmware X. What's what's the delta? Um, there's a there's a program called VCDIF um, protocol that it's that's used by other places too. This is a common thing, um, but it will automatically run it to find the appropriate update image for that particular device. And like if you have another device running a different piece of software, um, as long as Nerfs Hub knows about the firmware that's running on the device, it can compute that delta. So so it's kind of cool that it automates this process. It, it comes with it's not like a you get this for free. You have to prep for it. So if any of you are in this mode where you're optimizing bits like that, you have to make sure that your firmware images don't have like these unnecessary changes. And um, there's this whole area called deterministic builds, um, which is you know source code in the exact same bits out. So you think how hard can this be? And then you find out how many people have like the compiler puts in. You know, there's a date or timestamp someplace random. You know, the ordering of something depends on the file system, and that's one order one way, different order the next. Um, you have so many things, so many of these little changes. Um, and uh, we've, uh, if you like stare at the commits, you'll see like commits for like the past, I don't know, year and a half as we find and eliminate, um, you know, sources of non determinism in the builds. Um, yeah, we, we, we've surfaced some of this as uh, new settings and uh, can the configuration yeah, yeah. of the new project generation. And so like uh, periodically, it might be helpful if you're maintaining a, a longer term uh, nerves application, then you want to upgrade, go through an upgrade path uh, that uh, if you start a new sample uh, project using the latest nerves bootstrap tooling uh, and then compare the two, uh, you'll be able, it'll be, it'll be easier to be able to understand uh, some of the migration path. Um, typically, we don't. Uh, uh, what, 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 this stuff can also be found a lot, oftentimes, in the walking through the release notes of these projects. Um, but um, uh, we, have, we we try to be able to make it backwards compatible as, as best we can, such that you have to opt into these uh, things, like opt into uh, some of the deterministic build settings. Yeah. Yep. So, so Frank said something special in there about being deterministic, and and uh, he talked about timestamps. So you know what time it is, right, Justin? Nerves <laughs> <laughs> time. Nerves time. Frank? Yeah. <laughs> this is the, so okay. I guess this is in the description. That, so yeah. This is if you read, this is a setup for you, Frank. <laughs> yeah. So if you read the description, you get all the inside jokes, and they think they're funny. So this is basically a bad joke that never ends. <laughs> And basically started out like, oh, wow, that was clever, Justin. He said nurse time and when, what time it was. And, and uh, you know, it's part of the others listening that we, we have a library called nurse time, which the whole point is to keep track of the clock on the device, obvious, you know, obviously. So this joke has been repeated ad nauseum. So <laughs> awesome. <laughs> But but you've expanded nerves time. I've, yes, yeah. there is an expansion. There's nerves time zone. So all the fun of nerves time with the addition of zones. So uh, um, I think quite a few people are making clock-like things. Um, certainly there are a lot of devices, including the ones at my company, that have to schedule things. And these devices are in physical locations, so local time is is pretty important. Um, the uh, I think the, the, the two new libraries, um, um, one's called Nerves Time Zones, and that's the one that maintains the database. And a lot of, many of you are probably wondering, well, what about TZ data and TZ? Those are great time zone libraries, that's true. Uh, when you start counting bits, that's, uh, that's uh, what uh, made us um, um, build another alternative, which uses, uh, if you're familiar with anyone who's done this is familiar on your computer, you have user, share zone info. So the the uh, the, the new time zone library is called zone info, which unsurprisingly uses those zone info files, which amazingly compress well. Um, so that's great for shipping these things down to the time zone data down to these embedded devices. Um, and uh, yeah, new library. If you're doing this on your device, um, maybe check out the nurse time zones. It also hooks in with uh, so uh, with uh, the uh, the C runtime. So 
if you're going out to some third party um, C non Elixir app, you can have it reuse those uh, zone info files just like a regular Linux system. Yep, those will be in the uh, Nerves Time GitHub repo. Uh, right. We have uh, a, 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 a massive repositories for different helpful functionality facets. And uh, so, in addition to Nerves Networking, there's a Nerves Time. Um, and then, uh, you know, others, maybe not specifically nerves related, but there's uh, the circuits ones too um, that, that you can you can take a look at uh, for help with other things. You, you know, that's a good point. I totally forgot to mention that on the, I'm getting, trying out nerves for the first time, or, you know, I'm, I'm a novice user. That's, so the other route to go is um, there's a repository called the Elixir Circuits Quick Start, which is basically pre-built images that you just copy to a micro SD card, plug to a Raspberry Pi, it powers up, you can connect to it over. If wired ethernet is, is certainly an easy way of getting to it, but if you have your Raspberry Pi up to connect it up to display on some of the Raspberry Pi models, it will um, shoot up the prompt there. And you can kind of um, experiment with uh, um, I squared C, the different hardware interfaces. And uh, you know, if you just want to copy paste code, like just in your editor, type up def module, stuff like that, copy and paste into IEX prompt and you can try something out without even using any of the nerves tooling. So that's, thanks Justin for reminding me about that. Um, the other resource that I think we're all excited about, right? So it's, there's gonna be books finally for, for nerves coming out. So so it's been, this has been publicized on, on um, Twitter a little bit by Bruce Tate. So Bruce Tate, um, did a nerve series on Groxio, so you can get his content there. Mm -hmm. um, but he also um, started a Prague Prog book, which hopefully will be available soon. And then there's um, their follow-up little books um, in the future. So this is pretty exciting to me. This is something I think uh, I think we've all really wanted books on nerves. But oh my gosh, writing a book is a lot of work. So um, I'm really appreciative that Bruce. Uh, um, took this on. Is that Elixir Circuits uh, .github .io? Uh, maybe. It'll get, if you search GitHub, it's a, it would be Elixir Circuits um, Quick Start is the. Okay, so I know it, the Elixir Circuits GitHub IO gives you kind of the list of what libraries are used built on the Elixir Circuits set of libraries. And then the Quick Start is. I think just available via github.com slash elixir dash circuits slash circuits quick start. Yeah, so hopefully that gets everyone close enough. So I, I know Frank, you and I were talking last night and uh, there's something else that, that Bruce has going that, that you said was close to your heart and you want to make sure we talked about it. So Bruce has his open source software challenge to thank uh, three open source software maintainers. Uh, so, so how about each of you go, I'm just going to say, I want to thank the two of you and Connor. Um, and I know there's countless other people that work on nerves, but the, the, all three of you have done so much for nerves and it makes me really happy, uh, cause I love playing with devices. Uh, but what about for you all, who, who would you like to thank in the open source community? Do you want me to go, or you want to go? Yeah, to yeah. Don't don't all go at okay. once. <laughs> Bruce could go too. Just, He's joined the chat. That's right. <laughs> Point at each other. So, um, uh, well, I'll I'll start just to just to undo this jam. Um, I think the uh, yeah. Some days I look at nerves as just glue, right? Um, the whole point is to get the um the beam on the on a device. So, I mean, obviously the OTP team hugely um, is, is huge for this. Like the whole point of this whole project um, it, from my perspective was just to get their piece of software running on every device that I had. So, so big kudos to them. Uh, but the, the other part is, is something that we kind of hide. We hide a lot of the other piece. So we use embedded Linux, um, the Linux kernel and precisely. Um, and, uh, um, another tool called BuildRig. So Linux kernel has like zillions of uh, contributors, um, but 
the key reason why we use the Gleaming kernel is for the sheer number of device drivers and platforms it supports. I mean, we want to run on these pieces of hardware. This is a um, a pretty straightforward option for us getting support across of a lot of um, various boards. Um, and that takes a ton of work. Like, um, it's, uh, I don't think it can be understated how much work it is to try to get some of these, some device drivers working totally solidly so that they're just something that you don't even see anymore. Um, and then the other project is BuildRoot, right? The BuildRoot developers um, hide tons of, if, if anyone wants to like get some, like every once in a while, someone wants like, like OpenCV or, you know, QT or some of these big frameworks that are not on the beam, but uh, are critical for some reason or other to their embedded device, right? It's, it's uh, the magic for getting those to compile across all those platforms is kind of contained in um, build root. And uh, we definitely leverage that a lot. So point out those. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm gonna take a partial cop out on this one, uh, but but real talk wise, last year was a pretty rough year and uh, I ended up taking a little bit of more of a backseat than I was the uh, previous times. And it was really helpful to be able to, you know, uh, lean on Frank and Connor and, and John, especially when John Carson sort of came to uh, keeping up with the maintenance and, 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 and you know, even in the face of, of uh, all of what, what we had to deal with, uh, keeping things moving forward. Um, and, and so all in all, really, it's, it's uh, uh, any, everybody who's working on these projects is kind of like has to, has to champion the, the hero role and being able to keep things up to date. It's really important with open source and, and, and sometimes mundane when, uh, uh, when you deal with it, uh, the, the ongoing support and maintenance of these libraries, but it's so important. I mean, you know, like we all, we all know what that feeling is like when you uh, go to deploy something uh, that hasn't been deployed in like two or three weeks and it, there's just a few rough edges that might have been ironed out a little bit easier if uh, things were just kept up with uh, more frequently and so um, you know the the tired tired uh, efforts that are that everybody kind of pushed forward with and I'm looking forward to being able to um, to grow more uh, with others and innovate again, uh, and also uh, keep up with uh, the, that amount of maintenance that that day to day. So that was really helpful. Thanks. So all right, I, I feel like what? we're running out of time, and there are some really what? good questions on the chat. Yeah. All, all right. What do, you, what do you want to go through? Well, the, uh, I think we have one minute. I don't think we have a chance. So I guess maybe maybe do one, and then like. I'll be at the table, so you guys, uh, I'll be on the toucan thing. So certainly try to answer after this. Um, how, how about this one? How can I find components that are compatible with nerves? Seems like a good one minute question, hurry. <laughs> oh. Gotcha, I, I, if, if I were to restate it, I wanna do, I want to do something like I want to know the temperature. Like I want to, you know, I want to buy a thermometer, but I want to buy the thermometer that doesn't require me to port um, a whole, you know, library from C or something over that will just work. And um, I, I see that there's a great answer right here because the Elixir circuits uh, um, .github.io, it basically is a, a simple search for hex. So if you just, if, uh, um, if you scan through that, that will be the people that actually have written um, um, libraries that work with um, a decent number of sensors. And if you just pick the parts they did, then one would hope that you'd have a pretty um, high degree of success. Uh, the other thing is just to ask. At the, the, uh, we have a Slack channel. The, uh, the Nerf Slack channel is pretty active. I think if you ask, you'll at least get at least two or three suggestions, you know, maybe to, for, for some of the parts um be a little bit that that are easier um and i guess if, if that doesn't work out um some of the some of the parts that are pretty popular like on adafruit and spark fun that tend to tend to be more popular with nerves i guess modulo maybe a couple but uh the the typically hobbyist geared parts are 
are usually a little bit easier if you're getting into it. All right. Well, thank both. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Frank, for joining us today. Uh, it's been a lot of fun and I look forward to speaking to you guys in, in the uh, hallway trek. <laughs>